everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name's Damien. Um, how do you say the name of this presentation? Anyone? Darren, we already talked about this. You can't answer. Communication. 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 Did you read it and think it was a misspelling? No. No, purposeful. Good. Whew. All right. I used to have a lowercase t, and I got a lot of comments like, you can't even spell the name of your presentation. That's probably not good for one on communication. <laughs> this is purposeful. It's called communication. Communication is a portmanteau. That's a fancy word coined by uh, Lewis Carroll and Through the Looking Glass. It's basically a mashup of two words and two meanings. This is a mashup of the word commute and communication. Commuting is basically moving people around. Sometimes you move people from one location to another like with cars. Commuting is basically moving ideas, imparting, exchanging information. Sometimes you use words. So the portmanteau, the mashup of communication is to try and indicate the idea that when you communicate, you're moving ideas from one head to another. And sometimes you use words to do that. So that's kind of a high-level overview of what we're going to talk about today, communication, moving ideas with words. So in the spirit of commuting, I've tried to lay this out like a commute, like a journey. So we're going to talk about the destination, where we're going, the map, uh, the way that we're going to get there, the vehicle, the means that we're going to get there, and finally the driver. First of all, destination. Let's talk about Jean-Baptiste Girard, an old uh, Swiss Franciscan uh, philosopher. He said, by words we learn thoughts, and by thoughts we learn life. I love this quote because I agree with it. I think that words enable us to learn more about life, and that is a, an overarching reason on why I'm very interested in language, semantics, communication, linguistics, these types of things. Some other reasons that we might be here. Deeper shared understanding. Everyone in this room, I hope that you already are uh, somewhat adept at communication. Today, you're going to get deeper understanding. And since you're all in the same room, it's going to be shared. We're all going to share in this understanding together. We're going to be better, uh, another reason, a uh, place that we're going is to be better understood and, and better understand others. That is, when you're communicating and I'm trying to put an idea into your head, I want you to understand that idea as, as best as you can. And similarly, when you're communicating with me, I want to be, uh, to understand you better. And finally, what are your expectations? On a journey, sometimes you have a place that you're going, a destination. That's the reason that you take this trip. What is the reason that you're in this room today? What are you trying to get out of besides this room? Teams to communicate better. Awesome. Great reason. Anybody else? Why did you show up today? Yes. Better communicate with um, some customers that have trouble understanding. Okay. C communicate with customers. Fantastic. External communication. Good. Have people adopt good ideas. That's a horrible reason. Get out. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yes. If you have ideas, you want to be able to share those ideas. And, and by sharing those ideas effectively, maybe people will adopt them and vice versa. Great. Others? Yes. In the back. To be a more effective listener. Oh, fantastic. Very, very good. Yes. And communication is not only imparting information, but it's exchanging and being on the receiving end of that. Very good. Yes. One of you. Self-organized. I'll be really honest. I got here early. I got into another conference room. Uh -huh. and there's all these like pens and papers on the table, and it looked like it had to do something. So <laughs> laziness. One of my top reasons for doing yes, for not doing things. All right, great. You right there. People understand the different communication style. Ah, very good. Communication style is not fit for everybody. Certainly, absolutely. Many, many different ways to get thoughts from one head to another. And uh, we need to understand the different ways so we can better communicate with others. Super. One in the back I saw. Yeah. So I know it's a, it's a play on words. And I was thinking commute and communication. And I thought, you know, we're living in a world where we're all working remote. There's a lot of bad behaviors out there around communicating mm -hmm. um, when you're working remote. So I was hoping that was my expectation. Yeah. I, I that silver bullet on how we <coughs> We'll definitely talk about that today. That's definitely going to come up in the slides and the conversations. Sure. Did I see one over here? Anybody else? Yeah? Basically all of the above, but also to understand what your term communication is intended to mean. Okay. So when I hear it two weeks from now, I have an idea of what it is referring to. All right. Already accomplished, and hopefully you get a deeper understanding of it as we go on. Fantastic reasons. I think that I hope that you'll all... Uh, uh, your reasons will be satisfied at the end of this. If not, I have failed. I, I hope it's enjoyable, informational, educational, but at the same time, you had a reason for coming here, and if you drive your car and you don't reach your destination, your trip has failed. So I hope that we're able to reach all of these destinations today. Uh, map, how are we going to get there? I'm going to start with definitions, talk about words and the meaning, the, the glue that holds these uh, words and meaning together. 
From there, we're going to head over to Communication Town. I'm not going to talk about communication very much, which seems odd for a, a talk on communication, but it's only set up so that we can talk about miscommunication. We're going to talk about what it is, how to identify it and recognize it, uh, uh, what are uh, some effects of miscommunication, and more importantly, how to avoid it or reduce miscommunication. And finally, at the end, uh, we're going to very briefly talk about common languages, the benefits, the uh, disadvantages of uh, common languages. The vehicle, how are we going to get there? This is Zunzi, Chinese philosopher. He says, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. Now caveat, this was designed as a half or full day workshop full of exercises and back and forth discussion and exploration and going off the beaten path to explore interesting ideas. None of that's going to happen today because of time commitment. I have an hour and a half, that's why I checked at the beginning. So this is going to be very unidirectional today, just me peppering you with information. However, if you're interested in a longer version of this, please see me afterwards because it is a great half or full day workshop with a lot of exploration, discovery, work. It's a workshop, guided discussion, discovery and exercise, exploration, all of these things that unfortunately I can't do in an hour and a half, but hopefully it's still very valuable to you. Finally, since I only have an hour and a half, a lot of the exercises, instead of just cutting them out, I have included them as a scenic overlook. If you're ever taking a trip, you might see one of these signs and you get out of the car and you're able to look into the beautiful valley. That's not going into the valley and experiencing it firsthand, but at least you can get an overview of it. So that's what I'll do for these exercises. I'll give you a scenic overview, a scenic overlook of what this exercise is so you get a taste for what the full uh, workshop experience might be. Driver, hi, I'm Damien, this is me in 2D, 3D. Uh, I don't have any pithy quotes, so that's just the name of my company. Um, here's a couple labels that might be uh, relevant for this situation. I'm a tester. I started testing in 1993 at uh, CompuServe. I dropped out of The Ohio State University and started testing full time. Over the last 25 years, I've been at 15 different companies in the same amount of industries, airline, retail, finance, insurance, uh, all sorts of different industries, a lot of different methodologies I've used, a lot of different roles, a lot of different tools. Um, so I have a lot of uh, experience as a tester. I'm also an improviser. About 10 years ago, I took a year-long training of improvisation where I learned to do what they do in Whose Line Is It Anyway, if you've ever uh, seen that show, creating something from nothing on stage. Um, uh, and now I use improvisation, the skills and principles of improvisation in a lot of my talks and workshops. I use improv to teach how to communicate better, how to elicit and analyze requirements, how to do software testing. I'm also an artist. Um, not in this particular presentation, but I draw a lot of my own slides. I've just written uh, and illustrated my own children's book that I, I drew myself. Uh, I'm a son, a husband, a father. Um, uh, I obviously have parents, as we all do. I'm married. Uh, my two little kids are Alina, she's seven. Zachary is uh, just about five. And I'm an autodidact. Uh, as I said, I dropped out of university. This is all self-taught. And to that point, there's a title up here that's missing, is expert in communication, whatever that may be. I don't have formal training in communication, but I'm a voracious reader and learner. And let me tell you about the origins of this particular uh, workshop and this offering. About 12 years ago, I got married. Hooray! 10 months later, I got divorced. Boo! <laughs> so, people deal with divorce in different ways. For me, it was very painful, and the way I dealt with divorce was introspection. I said, man, that was awful. That really stunk. That was painful. I want to avoid pain, as most of you do. So how can I avoid pain? I started to introspect and do some root cause analysis on myself and dig deep. And I realized after some digging, it wasn't about the laundry and the dishes in the sink and all of these little superficial things. At the base, at the core, it was communication that was the issue. I wasn't actually communicating with my wife and she wasn't communicating with me. I didn't understand her, she didn't understand me. And when I realized that this was at the core of what caused my failed marriage, I thought, well, I want to avoid pain, I want to avoid divorce. I should probably become a better communicator. So that happened about 12 years ago, and over the past 12 years, I have learned and learned and studied and researched to become a better communicator myself. Now, I don't like the term expert. I don't even know what that means, whether it's bestowed on someone else or some people label themselves. What I'm gonna talk about today are things that I have learned that have worked for me to become a better communicator in my particular context. And as I said, I've worked in a lot of different places. I have a very rich life experience, as everyone in this room does, but these are things that have worked for me. If you happen to be in a familiar or similar context, then there's a good chance that they might work for you too. If not, maybe not. But maybe these ideas that I'm gonna talk about today will inspire you to go and learn on your own and figure out how some of these things have a core idea that you can build on and become a better communicator yourself. Make sense? All right, travel games. We've already had our first scenic out, uh, overlook here. I usually start this by presenting these idioms. Anyone know what an idiom is? 
An idiom is a phrase that it uses uh, a common language, an understood language, where you might know the individual meaning of each word in the sentence, but collectively they might mean something very, very different. So what I do is I ask everyone to read through this list, pair up with a partner, and try and find one that you already know, or you think you know the meaning of, or one that's unfamiliar to you, and you explain the sentence and the meaning of that sentence to your partner, and then they do the same back. And then we compare notes, we kind of debrief and say, who didn't know what this meant and how did you go about learning what it meant? Were you right? Were you wrong? Did you have a common understanding? So that's the type of exercise that we do to start off to show that sometimes miscommunication can happen even with simple little phrases that have uh, non-standard meanings. All right, let's start with definitions, words, and meaning. I'm going to go through definitions, some categories of them, some types of uh, definitions, and finally some characteristics. There's Socrates, Socrates, he says, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. Another quote I happen to love. I think if you're going to start uh, attempting to gain wisdom, you should first know, understand the terms that you're using and what those terms mean. Not just what they mean to you, but what they mean to others as well. If you don't understand what a word means, or you're using a word and someone else has a different understanding and meaning of that word, then you're not going to achieve wisdom. You're going to talk past one another. So let's start with the definition of the word definition. How many people have ever looked up the word definition in the dictionary? You have? You are very rare. It's usually no hands go up, so it is very rare. So I looked it up in OxfordEnglishDictionaries.com. That's my source for the definitions in this particular presentation. Definition in OxfordEnglishDictionaries.com is a statement of the exact meaning of a word, especially in a dictionary. Now, even before I looked it up, I had a general idea of what a definition is. Somebody asked me, even if I didn't have a dictionary available, I'd say, oh, OK, I have an idea what it means. So I looked it up, and this is what it read. I said, all right. Well, guess what? The definition of the word definition has a bunch of words in it. So I wondered, what if I look up each of those words? So the very first word after A that's interesting to me is the word statement. So I'm going to look up the word statement. Statement, a definite or clear expression of something in speech or writing. I'm trying to go deeper and understand what this word uh, definition actually means by looking up the words in the definition of definition. Getting too recursive for you? So now I have a definition of the word statement. I'm going to go back to my original definition and replace the word statement with that definition. Make sense? So now a de definition of definition is a definite or clear expression of something in speech or writing of the exact meaning of a word, especially in a dictionary. Next interesting word to me in this uh, definition is the word exact. What does exact mean exactly? I have a general idea, but I looked it up in Oxford English dictionaries. Exact is not approximated in any way. It's precise. Do the same thing, replace the word exact with that definition. So I'm just replacing, if you think about it, variables with the, uh, the uh, value of that variable. Next word, meaning. Oh boy, what does meaning mean? Look it up. Meaning is what is meant by a word, text, concept, or action. All right, so the very first word I encounter is the word meant. What does meant mean exactly? Let's look that up. Past and past participle of mean. Okay, that's not terribly helpful. I didn't gain any extra information. It's not helping me get deeper understanding. So what does mean mean? Intended to convey, indicate, or refer to a particular thing, to signify. Okay, what does intend? That seems like a very important word in this definition. What does intend mean? To have as a course of action, as one's purpose, objective, or plan. Purpose. That seems like an important word. Let's look up the word purpose. The reason for which something is done or created or why it exists. That's what purpose is. So let's back all, all the way out to the top and replace the word uh, um, meaning with the uh, definition for purpose. So our definition of definition, a definite or clear expression of something in speech or writing of the not approximate in any way precise reason for something for which something is done or created or which something exists. Following me? Getting a deeper understanding of the word definition? Deeper than you ever wanted, likely. Next word I'm interested in is the word word. What's word mean? It's a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing and so on. I'm going to replace the word word with that. Uh, especially in a dictionary. I'm going to uh, skip over especially. The next word that's interesting to me is dictionary. What is a dictionary exactly? Okay. Detour. Have you ever been taking a trip and you hit a detour? You have to veer off your path and go somewhere else to get back to your path. This is what detours are in this presentation. They're interesting ideas that are only tangentially related to what we're talking about, communication. I didn't want to drop them out because I think there's some learning there. So this is our first detour. I'm looking at the word dictionary and trying to understand what is a dictionary. Well, which dictionary? I happen to be using OxfordEnglishDictionaries.com, but there's a lot of different dictionaries. Speaking of that, this is John Ralston Saul. This is my favorite quote from him. Dictionary, opinion expressed as truth in alphabetical order. Now think about it. Why is there uh, Webster's? Why is there Cambridge? Why is there Oxford English Dictionaries? Why is OED? Oxford English Dictionaries online is different than OED. 
Why are there specific dictionaries? Why do different dictionaries exist? Because language and meaning is subjective. Ultimately, there's a group of editors somewhere in a room, and they've done etymology. They looked at origins of words and how they've created and how they've changed over the years. And they've come to some conclusion and said, this is what cat means, and we're going to write that in our dictionary. Somewhere across the pond, another group of folks is sitting in a room, and they've done the same exercise, and they say, this is what cat means to us. Why doesn't cat just have one meaning? This is useful if you're ever in a meeting or talking with someone, and they say, ah, that's not what regression testing is. Regression testing is, and they give you a definition, as if that is the global, worldwide definition that everyone understands it to be, instead of just their understanding or one dictionary's particular understanding. To prove this out a little bit more, let's look at the word dictionary. Here's four definitions of the word dictionary in four different sources. OED, a book which explains or translates, usually in alphabetical order, the words of a language. OK. The next one, Oxford Dictionaries, the sister publication to OED. A book or electronic resource, they've added that in. Ah, very modern of them to add that in. Electronic resource that lists words of a language in alphabetical order. Merriam-Webster, very useful for American English. Oxford and Oxford English dictionaries are better for uh, British English, and they uh, provide a lot of history and etymology of the word, where Merriam-Webster typically does not. Merriam-Webster says, a reference source in print or electronic form containing words usually arranged in alphabetical order. What about dictionary.com? Has anybody ever used that to uh, pull a uh, definition from? I love this. A book, optical disc, in case you're in the 90s, mobile device or online lexical resource, such as dictionary.com. They promote their own product in the definition. I thought that was kind of amusing. So I like this detour because when you think about which dictionary, it really drives home the point that there is no singular, worldly, worldwide accepted meaning for any word. There's no definition that everyone will agree to. It's a matter of perspective, a matter of subjectivity, a matter of editors in a room somewhere, and that's important to you when you're trying to communicate with others. There's no single definition for any word that you're using. All right, back to our huge blown out definition of definition here. A definite or clear expression of something in speech or writing of the not approximate in any way precise reason for something is done and created or for which something exists of a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing, especially in a dictionary. Whew. That's a mess. So I'm going to clean it up a little bit a clear expression of the precise intended reason for which a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing exists. So what is a definition? It's the whole reason that the word exists. Why does this word exist? Why is the definition there? Because the word is there. They exist because the other one is there. Now compare that with the original definition from OxfordEnglishDictionaries.com, a statement of the exact meaning of a word, especially in a dictionary. Do you feel you have a better understanding of the word definition now? After I did this exercise, I certainly felt like I understood the word definition a lot better. Now, as I said, I did this particular exercise. I call it definition dissection, where I dissect all the words in a definition, and I recursively go down and then back up. And sometimes I do that. Uh, I look up a word. I look up the definition. I look up the first word in that and the definition, the first word in that, the definition. I go down till I start to loop back. I don't expect you to read this, but this is what it might look like uh, if you represented this process graphically. And what you start to see is some of these, you can't see it here, loop back. You start to hit words that have already been defined higher up the chain. And if you start to do this process, you'll find out that eventually everything's related. All words are related. All meaning is related. So it's very interesting to realize that when I say any single word, it's just a placeholder, a, represent, uh, a representation of a larger idea. That larger idea can, present, can be thought of and expressed in words, which themselves are just a, a placeholder for a larger idea. And it goes on and on and on, never ending. It loops back on itself and it never ends. Every single word you say is packed with infinite meaning. If you think about the fact that anyone can communicate with anyone else, it's almost miraculous because every word I'm saying is packed with so much meaning. And I sure hope that you share the same meaning that I understand that word to mean. If not, we might be talking past one another. All right, another travel game. This is my most popular game. People love this, but it takes an hour, so clearly not uh, doable today. The way I do this is I divide the room into four, four groups, A, B, C, D. Each one of them gets a list of words. Cat, dog, some of them are homonyms or homophones like D-O-V-E that can be said different ways. Some of them are industry terms depending on what audience I'm talking to from their domain or their industry. And what I ask them to do is on a separate piece of paper, collaboratively, they come up with a dictionary-like definition for each word. After they've all done it, they have to talk and say, I think that cat means this and uh, regression means this and quality means this, and they're writing down their definitions. I take all the definitions and I shift them one to the left, 
and every group now has a list of definitions and an empty sheet, and they have to write down the word that matches that definition. It's harder than you think. Then I have a set of words, and I shift those left, and everyone has a new set of words, and they have to write down a definition. Then I take those definitions, shift them a final time, and the last team has to write down a word. And oftentimes, you'll get this. Uh, it starts with the word pen. Someone will write down an instrument used to write. The next group will say, well, that sounds like a pencil. So they write the word pencil, and the next group will write down something that you write with, and the last group will write pen. So it actually comes back to the original. But it's interesting when you use words like quality or value, or bug, defect, issue, problem. Do you use those words in your workplace? If you had to do this exercise with the people in your workplace, do you think that you'd all come to the same definition? Do you think you'd all come defect, defect, defect all the way to the end? I bet it's going to be difficult. And in fact, I've done this dozens of places all over the world, and it's very often that these words change meaning. And it's very enlightening. The debrief is the best part of this, is seeing how these words evolve and change based on different perceptions. And that's enlightening because sometimes if you do this at a company, they say, wow, we all use the word defect every single day in conversation and JIRA tickets. And we, we use this word, but we all have a different understanding of what it means. Yikes, we not, might not actually be communicating. All right, let's talk about some categories of definitions. This is uh, intentional, extensional, ostensive, and enumerative are a couple subtypes. Intentional definition gives the meaning of a term by specifying all the, specifying all the properties required to come to that definition. The necessary and sufficient conditions for being this thing is the essence or spirit. This is a big mouthful, again, from Oxford English Dictionaries. Think of it like this. I like the essence or the spirit. I'll demonstrate it this way. Ghost. What is a reasonable definition of ghost? What is necessary and sufficient to be a ghost? Well, to be a ghost, the first thing, it has to be dead. If you're going to define a ghost, you can't say something that's living, a ghost is going to be dead. So that's a necessary condition of being a ghost, if you're going to try and define this word. Another thing is ghosts typically appear to the living. So a dead thing that appears to living, living things. Also, they're usually translucent. You can see through ghosts. So if you were going to define ghost, somebody said, hey, define ghost for me. Give me an extensional definition, or intentional definition. You might say, well, the necessary and sufficient conditions to be a ghost has to be dead, has to be kind of translucent, and has to appear to, dead, or has to, appear to live people, living people. That is an intentional definition. It's the properties that make a ghost a ghost and not a chair. So. There's another category of definition. Extensional identifies the members of the class it names by indicating instances of the thing. This is basically examples. So what if you were trying to explain to somebody ghost? You say, well, it has to be dead. It has to appear to the living. It has to be translucent. And they're saying, I don't understand what you mean. I don't know what translucent means. I don't know what it You say, well, let me give you some examples of ghosts. For instance, Space Ghost, Casper the Ghost, Blinky the Ghost. These are examples. So if you can't define something, sometimes it helps to provide examples of that thing. That might help understanding with somebody that's struggling to understand you. There's another subtype of extensional called ostensive. That's where you actually point at the thing. So this might be useful if you're trying to define red. What is red? Well, it's the hex or RGB, uh, these values. Uh, boy, it's really hard. It's kind of like Blinky. Have you ever seen Blinky the ghost? No. OK. That is red right there. Some of these chairs are red. You can point at something. It's actually pointing at something to help uh, extend understanding. If you're having trouble understanding someone or they're having trouble uh, understanding you, you can use an ostensive definition. And finally, there's one called enumerative. Enumerative is where you list all of the things in the class. So you've tried to give an intentional definition. Uh, it's translucent. It appears to live people. I don't get it. Well, do you know space ghost? No. I point to space ghost. They still don't get it. You say, well, let me name all the ghosts ever. That's not doable. So enumerative would not be a good way to try and define ghost. But it might be good for continents or something that has a limited set. I don't understand what a continent is. You've given me a definition. You've told me Africa and Asia. Well, if you named all seven of them, you say, that's all seven of the continents. That might be another way is provide someone with an enumerative definition to help foster understanding. So just, just in different ways, if people are struggling, struggling to get the idea that's in your head, try these different categories of definitions to foster understanding. Or similarly, ask them. You're struggling to understand them, say, can you give me an example? Is it a fixed or finite set? Can you tell me all of them so I understand what you're talking about? Uh, there's continents. All right, uh, types, lexical, precising, stipulative, and persuading. First one is lexical. Lexical is what you might find in a dictionary. You open up Merriam-Webster. What you're looking at are lexical definitions. For instance, here's ghost again. The spirit of a dead person that someone sees or hears. That's something that you might find in a dictionary. The next type I would like to talk about is precising. Precising is when you add information to a definition to make it more precise. 
For instance, it used to say the spirit of a dead person that someone sees or hears. Now I've made it more precise by saying the usually translucent spirit of a dead person that someone sees or hears. I've made this definition more precise, more robust by adding information. Precising is very useful uh, when you want to take a definition and make it precise for a particular purpose. For instance, if you think about the definition of student, student might be someone that attends uh, a place of higher learning or a, a university or something like that. However, at a movie theater, they might define student as someone over the age of 18 that attends a university or something. Why? Because maybe they have price breaks or they can't get in certain movies. They have provided a more precise definition of that. That leads into stipulative. Stipulative is when you bestow meaning on an existing word or coin a new word. So ghost, the usually translucent spirit of a dead thing. That doesn't have to be a dead person. Now it's a dead pet or a dead plant. I've stipulated that for the remainder of this uh, talk, every time I say ghost, it means any dead thing. Don't just think about people. I have stipulated the meaning. So I've taken an existing word with an existing definition and I've applied my own meaning to it. This is also how new words are coined. People say, I've come up with a brand new word and I stipulate the meaning to be this. No one can argue with them and say, that's not what that word means because they've stipulated it. There's a great passage again from Lewis Carroll where he talks about, if I open a book and at the beginning the author says, for, for the remainder of this book, every time I say black, it shall mean white. Every time I say white, it shall mean black. I have to humbly agree and understand that that's what the author means by those words. They have stipulated the meaning of those words. This is useful if you are working in a place and you're arguing over what does defect mean, what does bug mean, are they synonyms, do they mean something different? Come up with your own new word. Coin a brand new term and stipulate the meaning that you can all share. No one can argue with you because you've stipulated it. Or say, whatever bug used to mean in the past, we're going to stipulate that it means this within the boundaries of our company so that we can better communicate with one another. Finally, persuasive, the usually translucent, unholy spirit of a dead uh, thing that someone sees or hears. This is persuasive language. This is emotive language, subjective language intended to persuade or manipulate someone, how they think about something. You might run into persuasive uh, type of definitions when people are talking about politics or religion. They might, if they're saying, well, what exactly is a conservative? What exactly is a religious zealot? They might use words and you will now recognize them as being persuasive because that's a motive, that's subjective. Wait a second, are you trying to manipulate me and think something by the way that you presented this definition? That's important that you recognize these things and be cautious to, uh, when you're trying to define something that not use those types of words yourself. All right, uh, some characteristics of good definitions. Equivalence, there's a word on one side, think about an equal sign, and the other side is the definition. They should be equivalent to one another. If the definition does not represent the word, then they're not equivalent. Essential characteristics, I already talked about that a little bit. The things that are essential to being a ghost. You could say translucent, appears to, dead, uh, appears to live people, it's dead. What about tall? Ghost tall? Well, that's not necessary to being a ghost. The ghost, ghost could be short or tall, so that's not a necessary characteristic. It's not an essential characteristic, so don't include non-essential characteristics in your definitions. Clarity. Definitions should serve to uh, provide clarity to the word. They should uh, not be ambiguous or vague and cause uh, more confusion. And finally, neutrality. I already talked about persuasive type language, emotive language. If you're using uh, emotive language, then you're probably not providing a neutral definition. Um, travel games, this is where I, I play the elephant test. The elephant test is, uh, actually this came from a, an old court case, uh, I forget the year, 1964. It's a court case where they had to, uh, Jacoby versus uh, State of Ohio, I think it was, and it was around uh, pornographic content. And it all came down to, well, what exactly is pornographic content? And it came to a judge to decide whether the defendant or prosecution wins on, and it hinged on this definition of pornographic content. And the judge said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And from this came the elephant test. Sometimes people have dis, uh, trouble defining a term, but they know it when they see it, kind of like an elephant. So the idea here, the exercise, is for people to define an elephant using intentional definition, an extensional, ostensive, to use different types, provide a definition of an elephant that they might find in a dictionary. Use persuasive language. Make me love or hate an elephant by defining it in such a way with emotive language in it. Also, make sure that your uh, practice using uh, uh, equivalence. Does your definition of elephant, does it include all the necessary and sufficient conditions? Is it equivalent to the word elephant? So it's just an exercise for people to practice doing these things so that when they get back to their desk and they're trying to define terms in a company glossary or a team glossary, they're better at creating effective, useful uh, words and definitions. All right, another detour is just semantics. Anybody ever heard this word or this phrase? Have you ever said this phrase? 
Chances are, in my experience, when I hear someone say it's just semantics, they might mean, well, it's a big difference. You, you mean this, and I mean that, and it's a huge gap between us. Maybe they say, ah, it's just semantics, meaning it's just a minor difference. Most often, when I hear people say it's just semantics to me, I think what they actually mean by that is shut up and go away, this conversation's over. That's most often what I understand it's just semantics to mean. But semantics is very important. Uh, there's Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. You keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. What does the word semantics mean? You want to offer a guess? Same meaning. Same meaning. I love it. Yeah. There's the definition of semantics from Oxford English Dictionary. Some group of editors said, this is what we believe semantics to mean. The meaning of a word, phrase, sentence, or text. If that looks familiar, it's because this is the definition of definition, a statement of the exact meaning of a word. Semantics and definitions are almost synonyms. They both talk about meaning of a word. So if somebody says, it's just semantics, I usually say, it is indeed semantics. You are absolutely correct. We are having a discussion about meaning of words, and this is where we're, we're not agreeing. So it is a semantic discussion. If you think about it, anyone have children? Young children. Every time your young child says, why, 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 those are semantic discussions. Or what is that? What's a cloud? What's this? What's that? Daddy, what's a cloud? My, my four-year-old, five-year-old asked me. I say, oh, man, I know what a cloud is. I know it when I see it like an elephant. I have to define cloud. It's tough for me to come up with a definition. But that is a semantic discussion. I'm talking about meaning with my kid. All right, definitions. Uh, this is all about relativism. That's Anton, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, interesting cat. Is, 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 the idiocy of the word uh, haunts me. If it were abolished, human thought might begin to make sense. I don't know what anything is. I only know how it seems to me at this moment. This is important. The idea of relativism uh, extends to all sorts of things, truth and knowing. But in this case, I'm uh, using the idea of relativism with regards to language and definitions. Again, if you're talking to someone at work and they say, no, 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 agile is this. That is their perception at that moment. There is no singular definition that everyone everywhere will agree with. Again, which dictionary? There's no such thing as the dictionary. There's a dictionary. And this is where the idea of relativism, subjectivity, perspective comes in. Michael Bolton, uh, tester, uh, uh, co-creator of rapid software test uh, uh, methodology, came up with this thing he calls the relative rule. And it's based off the uh, relativism idea. For any abstract x, x is x to some person at some time. I rephrase this as uh, things like bravery, courage, humor, quality, problems are only describing a relationship between someone and something at some time. Something that's funny to me as a child might not be funny to me as an adult. The joke itself is unchanged, but it's, the humor has changed for me. Something that's painful for you might not be painful for me because the relationship is different, although the pain stimulus might be the same. So relativism is very important, again, in understanding ideas like truth and pain and courage and abstract concepts, but they're also important in uh, language and linguistics. If you understand that it's very subjective, that will help you better communicate with other people. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. All right, we're leaving definitions, words, and meaning, going on to communication. I'm going pretty fast. Is everybody all right? Questions, comments so far? All right, I'm floating. Communication, we'll talk about, again, thank you, Socrates, start with the definition. We'll go on to talk about some models of communication and then how we communicate. Communication, the imparting or exchanging of information of news. Thank you, OxfordDictionaries.com. Uh, I like this one. I found this in another source. The act of transferring information from one place to another. I like that because it made, it made me think of commuting. So I kind of like that definition. It fit in well nicely with this presentation. All right, some different models. Again, this is my own experience, my own research. People dedicate their entire careers, sometimes lives to researching these different models of communication. I have not. I know just enough to be dangerous. Here are a few different models that people have put together that try and explain how we get one idea from one head to another. There's the transmission model, SMCR. I'm not going to read them all. The only one that's a little bit different is the tier interaction model. I'll speak about that. They're all different. Uh, they generally all build on the, the one that came prior, and they add more information in a more complex model. But here's something that they all have in common. Generally, they all have some idea of a sender sitting on one side. And the sender has some idea in their head, and they encode it using different words, and they send this message across some particular channel. They choose some medium to send this message. The channel might have noise that's interfering with the message and decaying it, and the receiver gets it, and they decode it, and this is roughly how we communicate, regardless of which model you look at. Here it is graphically. 
Again, you got your sender over there. He has this idea. He decides the words that he wants to use, and he encodes it, sends it through some kind of channel it's interfered with. This guy gets it. It's decoded, and he says, ah, this is the message you've sent me. Now, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in this process. A lot can go right, but a lot can go wrong. I said earlier, it's almost miraculous that we can communicate with anybody ever because so many different things can go wrong. For instance, if everything goes really well and he has a clear idea, uses the, uh, good words uh, with meaning that they share, and he sends it through a channel that's appropriate for their uh, communication and it doesn't have a lot of noise and the message gets to the other person with very little decay and they're able to decode it, guess what can go wrong? This, this is Satir's interaction model. The person intakes the information, the message, and the next thing is the past experience, uh, their experience, their bringing, their context, uh, influences the meaning, significance, and how they accept that. So everything goes well, and I say, hey, we should really start a fire tonight. And I use the right words to say it, and I send it through a message, and they got the, every word exactly as I intended it, and they decode it, but their dog just died in a fire last week, and all of a sudden the word fire has a much different meaning for them. So even if everything goes right over here, I can't control their past experience. I can't control how they interpret the words that I, and my intentions of those words. This is why communication, again, is almost miraculous, that uh, because of the Satir interaction model, you can't control how someone interprets the words that you say. OK, how do we communicate? A lot of different ways. What's the best method of communication? Talking. Like, talking how? What's that? Out loud. OK, you, vocalization, verbal, face to face, I think I heard somebody say. Cool, yeah. What if you were to remove the boundaries of reality? Use your imagination. Telepathic. telepathic, ding, there you go. Telepathy, can you imagine if we could communicate via telepathy? Wouldn't that be great? It'd be scary, yeah. We wouldn't have to rely on these crude words and all that. This would be great. If you use your imagination, this is a tongue in cheek kind of fun section, but if you use your imagination and say, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could communicate by telepathy? We would all understand each other so well. But if you start to think about it and break it down critically, it starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Like if you think, if I have an accent, do you hear it in my accent? What if I speak a different language? Forget about accent, and you don't speak that language. Are you able to understand me? What if uh, the name of my company, Ineffable Solutions, the word ineffable means something that's difficult or even impossible to describe with words, like the uh, vastness of space or the beauty of a sunset. So what if I'm trying to describe, using crude words, the, the beauty of a sunset, and I say, forget about words, just read my mind. Is there any guarantee that they're going to get an accurate image of this ineffable concept in my mind. Even with telepathy, you have all these sorts of problems. And I'm not going to spend more time. I go deeper into it and I let the audience suggest problems with telepathy. But we don't have telepathy. We are stuck with words and even cruder forms of communication. Miraculous. So something very close to telepathy is an idea called ideasthesia. You may recognize it uh, by the term synesthesia. Has anybody ever heard of that term? Synesthesia? Okay, synesthesia is an older term. This is the newer term. What it is is a mixing of senses uh, in the mind that makes you uh, have one input uh, interpreted as another. Uh, the most common one is people that uh, see numbers in different colors or different textures. The number nine is very blue and the number seven is very wooden and hard. So they're getting textual and color information from seeing or hearing a number. Somebody says seven and they, they think and, and feel these colors or a warmth. They're mixing their senses. That's why it was called synesthesia. Seizia is the mixing of something. Sina is the Greek word for senses. Idea seizia is the new term because it's more that the mixing doesn't happen in the sensories. It happens in the brain. Your ideas are mixing. So this is a real phenomenon. Uh, there's a, a, a segment of the population that experiences synesthesia, idea seizia. I'm going to give you the next closest thing, uh, an experiment by Ramachandran. He's done uh, uh, recently. These are two characters. One of these characters is named Buba. And the other character is named Kiki. Now, I have not told you which character is which, but by a show of hands, what's the name of this character? Kiki. And? Booba. I didn't tell you, but I would say that most of you, if maybe all of you, came to the same conclusion. You were able to vocalize a name, come to some deduction over uh, the names of these two uh, uh, blobs, these two uh, characters here, without me telling you. How was that? Why did you know or assume this was Kiki and this was Booba? Sharper. So sharper points on a visual image. Your eyes are taking this in 
and I said the word kiki, that's auditory, and somehow you took this visual image and you matched it with an auditory signal and you said those two things go together. And booba? Kind of roundish sounding, yeah, kind of round like this. And again, same thing. You're matching an auditory and visual signal together in your head and you're mixing them up. So this is very close to idea seizure. This is one way uh, communication happens. All right, let's get to some more realistic ways. Nonverbal. Nonverbal communication. What if I came to you and said, hey, it's really great to see you. You think it's really great to see you? Because? I'm slouching. What about my voice? It was low. I was talking slowly. So the pitch, the volume, the cadence of your voice, there's all sorts of clues and cues that can be built in, extra information into the message. What if I said, hey, wow, I really hate your guts. Same type of thing. There's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens. At that point, there's uh, Paul Watzlawick. One cannot not communicate. What do you think that means? Always communicating. Once one living creature has been made aware of another, communication has begun. Even if there's great distance, I can't see you, I can't hear you, I can't smell you, but uh, I mean, I can see you, I've been made aware of you. Or maybe I can't see you, maybe I'm only smelling you. Communication has begun. I can smell you, so that smell is telling me something about you. Or maybe I can't smell you, but I can see you in the distance, and maybe you can't even see me. Communication begins instantly. Judgments start to happen. I start to form opinions. So one cannot not communicate. Once it's begun, you can't stop through nonverbal communication. If someone's walking towards me, I can't smell them. I, can't, I haven't heard them. They haven't talked to me yet. But if they're walking towards me like this, Communication has begun. I might want, to, uh, might want to watch out because they're coming for me. Nonverbal communication is very important. There's a lot of information built into it. Think about how this works in your workplace. You're proposing a new idea in a meeting or one-on-one, -on -one, and the person is sitting in their chair, and they slowly are changing their position to this or to this. Or if you're communicating with somebody and you're talking, and they start doing this. What are they communicating? They don't like it, or maybe they're confused. Nonverbal communication can tell you something about the other person, and you can pick up on that. Hey, do you understand what I'm saying? It looks like you might have questions, or is this something that you're not interested in? What, what uh, you seem reserved, and how do you know that? Your body language. Now, this is a heuristic. It's not a formula or an algorithm. It doesn't necessarily mean maybe they're just, their back hurt or they just wanted to change their position, but sometimes these are indicators that can lead you to a uh, better understanding. Say it with feeling, another uh, scenic overlook. I have uh, a deck called the emotional deck and it has all these different emotions on it and I pass it out and anyone that wants to play, it's one's angry, one's suspicious, one's excited and everyone that wants to play will one at a time stand up and read this exact same sentence but they have to ev evoke the emotion on the card and the rest of the crowd has to try and guess that emotion. This is a way to show how much information is built into nonverbal communication. So one person might say, we have enough food to last for a week? What was I? Unsure. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this game is when the person had unsure in their card and they went, I have enough food to last for a week, and the other person says angry. It's like either they are bad at reading body language or this person's body language and nonverbal communication was not enough to express the fact that they are unsure. That can cause miscommunication both on both ends, receiver and sender. Uh, verbal. We're talking about verbal right now, face-to-face -face communication. Again, the tone, the volume of your voice, the cadence, the speed at which you speak packs a lot of information into our messages that we're trying to get back and forth between each other. Written, what about all caps? Does that say anything? If somebody writes something in all caps, the taboo? What's that? Important, Important serious, yeah, potentially. Again, it's a heuristic. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It maybe just means that the cap locks is, is stuck or something like that. But it's a heuristic that says maybe there's more information that I need to be reading into this message. What's a problem with written communication? What are you missing? The intent? How, how so? Explain that. Well, because you you're not able to see what someone means when they're not trying to speak with you. So, mm -hmm. you know, on a text message, you could think someone's upset when really they're just telling you something. Exactly. Yeah. You're missing all kinds of other nonverbal uh, cues. Same thing with a phone. You can hear their voice, but you can't see that their face is all twisted up, perhaps, or their body language. So these are uh, worse ways of communicating rather than face-to-face -face or, oh, wouldn't it be great telepathy? 
And finally, words. That's the focus of today's uh, talk. We, we often use words. Now, as I said uh, in the earlier slide about myself, I'm an artist, I'm a husband, a son, a father, an improviser. There's a lot of different ways that we communicate with each other. As an artist, sometimes I draw pictures or I sculpt, and what I'm trying to do is communicate a feeling or an idea to somebody without using words at all. But today, we're talking mostly about words that are one of our primary ways of getting one idea from one head to another. All right, oh, another detour, meaning without words. There's a Wittgenstein. The limits of my language means the limits of my world. What do you think he meant by that? He chose these words. He had an idea in his head. He said, I'm going to encode this idea with these words. I'm going to send it through this medium. And Damien put it up on this slide. And you are all the receivers. You're getting it. You're decoding it. What's the meaning? What meaning did you get from this quote? I only know what I know. You only know what you know. Can you expand on that? No. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> well, if you don't have a word to represent an image or, con or a thing or concept, then that their concept doesn't exist. I love it. Yes, I think that that's what he meant. And I, I first learned of this quote while hearing about interesting studies about feral children that were raised without language or people that had some type of disability that, that did not uh, allow them to have a language. What happened in some cases, uh, Radiolab, anybody ever listen to Radiolab? <clears throat> fantastic NPR podcast. I had a couple stories uh, about this, about these different cases, um, where someone did not have language and they finally came to have language through guidance and coaching and teaching. And one of the interesting things is one of these students just had a eureka moment one day. They sat through weeks and months and months of class and then one day they stood up and they were very excited and it wasn't until much later that they had a language sufficient to explain. They said, what happened that day that you jumped up and were so excited in class? They said, that's the day I realized that things have names. Things have names. He didn't realize chair, ceiling, clicker, screen. Everything has a name, a label attached to it. He had no idea. Now, while he could certainly touch a stove and experience pain, he didn't have words, so he couldn't conceptualize the idea of pain. So his world was absolutely limited from his words because he didn't have any. Now, how does this apply to us? How big is your vocabulary? Do you have a rich vocabulary or a limited vocabulary? If you have a limited vocabulary, perhaps you are limiting your own experiences, the way that you're able to conceptualize abstract ideas. And if you are limited yourself and you're trying to express something to someone, maybe it's not clear in your own head, so you're going to have a very difficult time expressing it to someone else because you don't even have the words or language to conceptualize it in your own head. It's a very theoretical, hand-wavy, philosophical detour here, but something to think about and consider. All right, let's move on to miscommunication. Definition, of course, talk about causes, effects, and reduction. Miscommunication, failure to communicate adequately. I've broken it down. I've done my definition dissection for you. Failure, roughly the lack of success. To communicate, we already said, it's imparting or exchanging information. Adequately, what does adequately mean? Adequately is to a satisfactory or acceptable extent. Do you ever think that communication is binary? You either do it or you don't. Well, actually, it's a continuum. It's degrees. Think about communication as a long line. And at some point, there's a, a, a bar or a, a mark somewhere. And on this side of it, you're not communicating. On that side, you are communicating. So on this sense, in this sense, if that's the metric that you're going to use or the measurement, it is binary. You're not communicating on this side of the line, and you are over here. However, what if you're just barely communicating? You're just over the line. Or what if you've really, really richly communicated with someone and really expressed your idea, and they have a deep understanding? Or what if you're on this side and you've just barely not communicated the idea? They're almost able to grasp your idea, but you're, at this point, you're still not communicating. You're miscommunicating. So if you think about communication as a continuum, and that bar, that line, moves. Every time I talk to somebody different, that line is going to move. Maybe I have to provide extensional and intentional and ostensive definitions for one person so that they, I'm able to communicate with them. With another person, maybe I just give them an intentional, a dictionary definition, and that's sufficient. It's adequate, and I've communicated with them. So if you think about communication as a continuum, it can help you, again, better uh, deal and communicate with different people. And same with you. All right, another detour, failure to communicate. There's the captain. Anybody know what movie he's from? Cool Hand Luke, one of my favorite movies, yes. And if you're unfamiliar with the movie, a very high-level summary, uh, Paul Newman plays a prisoner at this uh, jail, and a captain right here is the warden, and Paul Newman escapes, and they catch him and bring him back. They say, hey, don't escape. And guess what? Paul Newman escapes again. And they catch him and they bring him back. And they say, doggone it, don't escape. And they put some chains on his legs. And Paul Newman, that rebel, he escapes again. 
and they catch him and bring him back. And there's a very famous scene in the movie where the captain says they beat him and they throw him down in front of all the other prisoners as an example. And the captain says, what we've got here is failure to communicate. Some men you just can't reach. Now, the reason I have this detour in here is to talk about recognizing miscommunication. Clearly, the captain was trying to communicate something to Cool Hand Luke. Hey, don't escape. Why did he say he was having a failure to communicate? How did he recognize that there was a failure to communicate? He kept escaping, yes. Well, clearly, you are not getting my message. I have this idea in my head, and it's, hey, don't escape. I'm trying to communicate this to you with chains and with words. Maybe you're not getting my message. So this is a fun little example of one silly way that you can recognize miscommunication. What are other ways that you might recognize miscommunication? By reaction. By the reaction. What, do you, what do you mean by that? If you say something and then they're instantly angry. Mm, okay. So uh, if, uh, I, I used earlier the idea of expressing someone something, some idea to someone and they do this. Right? So you said angry, that might be one. I expressed an idea and they go, ah. Maybe they didn't understand. You're like, oh, I didn't mean you to get angry. Or maybe they just do this. Mm. They twist their face up or they scratch their head. Maybe that's another thing like, oh, I think we might not be communicating. This might be miscommunication. I might be on this side of the line. What's another way? How can you recognize miscommunication is happening or has happened? Sorry? The way they communicate back. Go on. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. That's a great example. Miscommunication is happening right now, but by you asking questions and me providing answers to your questions and you asking, we're trying to stop miscommunication. We're trying to reduce it. That's fantastic. So you've recognized it by the fact that you're uh, tackling it. You're trying to reduce it. Good example. Mm hmm Ah. So how might you recognize? Maybe you don't recognize that while it's happening. How might you recognize that afterwards? Yeah, the results? Like <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even recognize that miscommunication has happened until afterwards, and the results don't match up with the expectations. And you say, oh, wow, I told you to do this one thing, and you did this other thing. Why did you do that? Well, you said this. Yeah, I did say that. Wait, what does that mean to you? Well, it means this. Oh, that's not what it means to me. <gasps> wow. Well, I wish we knew that before. We only realized it after the fact. So sometimes miscommunication is recognized after the fact, but wouldn't it be great if you could recognize it during? And that's to your point. If somebody's asking questions, if someone's face is like this, you might recognize while it's happening, this is, we are miscommunicating. And that's one way that you can catch it before it gets worse and spirals. Um, here's again uh, some of the common uh, things that are in all communication models. What can go wrong as a sender? What might cause miscommunication as a sender? Different experiences, the satire interaction model, right? Or what if I don't have a clear concept myself, a half-baked idea? So I'm trying to get an idea into your head, but I don't even fully understand it myself. That might be one problem. What about encoding it? I got a crystal clear idea in my head. I know exactly this, this thing is very clear. I thought about it a lot. But then maybe I choose the wrong words. I choose the wrong words. Inappropriate words are words that don't properly express this crystal clear idea. Message. I send it by the wrong message or maybe through the wrong channel. I, I use something that's very important and I text you rather than call you so you can hear the urgency in my voice and you didn't get that through a text message. Or what about noise? I choose a channel that's being... Uh, degraded in some way. I'm trying to talk to you about something important. It's windy and you're only catching every other word. Or there's all sorts of different channels, different mediums that can degrade a message. Receiver gets it and back to the satire interaction model. They decode it and their past, their experience, their context influences uh, their interpretation and meaning that they apply to that message. So all sorts of things can go wrong and cause miscommunication. Here's some more causes. Jargon, acronyms, abbreviations. You have those in your workplace, right? Does everybody use acronyms and jargon and abbreviations? How about when you have a new hire? You think that might cause miscommunication with a new hire that's not familiar with your company acronyms or your industry jargon? 
Would you say if we were to play that round robin game and I put some of your company terms or jargon on that definition list and then you wrote down a definition and passed it to someone else on your same team, your same department, would they be able to recognize that your definition is that term? That jargon, that acronym? Maybe not. So this is a very common way that miscommunication can happen sometimes. Using jargon, acronyms, abbreviations that are not well defined or well explained or that have different meanings to different people. Another one, indirect communication. There's two different types of indirect communication. One is um, when I tell Bob and Bob tells Bill and Bill tells Joe and Joe tells Sarah. Sarah might have a very, very different interpretation of the message that originated with me. That's indirect communication. Instead of me going directly to Sarah and telling her it's gone through this thing, this is the telephone game. You've all seen this telephone game. And that's one of the travel games we play is I start a message over here and it goes one by one, people whispering in her ears. And by the time it gets over there, it's completely different. Now that can happen just for natural causes. There's uh, the channel that we've chosen whispering in someone's ear. There's ambient noise in the room. Sometimes I ask the rest of the audience to clap or snap to make it harder for the two people to hear, to hear what's being whispered. So the channel is inappropriate. It's being degraded by noise. Sometimes I get a, a, a conspirator in the room and I say, I want you to purposely change a few words. What about people that might have an agenda in your company? and you're doing indirect communication. You tell Bob, Bob tells Joe, and Joe thinks it's a bad idea, so Joe tells Sarah something different that's more in line with his motives. So there's all sorts of indirect problems with indirect communication, but there's another type of indirect communication which is more devious. If I was to say to my wife, boy, it takes a long time to drive the kids to school, and boy, oh boy, the, the grocery store is so far, and ah, oh, the commute to work is such a drag. She might say, are you saying that you'd like to move? Do you, do you want to move so that maybe we're closer to these things? I say, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I wasn't being very direct about it. I was indirectly communicating an idea by telling you th all these things around it, beating around the bush. That's another way that indirect communication can cause miscommunication. If I was saying work is far and the kid's school is far, but she didn't get my message, I might not be communicating. I might be miscommunicating. This is Skype. This is uh, a game kind of like the telephone game where I have a group of people line up. And this time, it's all about nonverbal communication. Everyone faces the wrong, uh, away from me except for the person in front, and I do a series of body movements and hand movements. Then they have to turn around, tap the next person, do the exact same ones, and it goes down the line, and always by the end, it's completely different movements. Just to show that even non-verbally, messages can change because of indirect communication. Miscommunication can occur. Accents and dialects. Uh, my father came over on the boat from Greece when he was 19, and to this day, still has a very, very thick Greek accent that's very difficult for a lot of people to understand. This sometimes causes miscommunication with even me, his son. And it could oftentimes cause miscommunication with the diverse workplace that we all work in. Accents and dialects, sometimes it's not someone from a different country, it's someone from a different region that may have idioms that they use or ways of speaking that are very difficult to understand and sometimes that can lead to miscommunication. How can you go about solving that? Ideas? We'll talk about ways to reduce miscommunication, but I'm just interested. How might you go about uh, getting around this cause of uh, miscommunication. Open, open discussion about just being honest with the person saying, and you do, it's no offense to you, I'm having trouble understanding, just having that open discussion that sometimes I mishear what you're saying, mm -hmm. or even like openly say, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Like it's a word that you think they're saying that means something different to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, that's exactly one of the ways I suggest later. We'll talk about ways to reduce miscommunication. Sounds easy. It's easy sitting in this room to say, just ask them or explain that to them, but social norms make it not so easy. It's not always that easy to tell someone on the third time, what? Say, oh, listen, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty understanding you. So sometimes you have to uh, go over these very difficult social hurdles to facilitate better communication and avoid miscommunication. Uh, oh, George Bernard Shaw, a funny quote. England, America, two countries divided by a common language. I like that. Um, another one, homonyms. This is an umbrella term for a lot of different things. Heterographs, ho uh, heteronyms, um, homographs. Uh, a lot of different ways, especially in written language, uh, that these can cause miscommunication. I, I, I said earlier, D-O-V-E is one of the words I use in uh, dictionary definition. What is that word, D-O-V-E? Or dove, yes. So if that word is on a piece of paper and people are saying, ah, a white bird with feathers and they're trying to write that down, somebody else might say, well, I read it as jumping off of a diving board. So sometimes uh, 
those heteronyms can cause miscommunication. What about bark? What does bark mean? Could be a dog. Yes, yeah, so sometimes spoken. Sometimes it's, it's confusing when written. Sometimes it's confusing when spoken. And words like uh, road. How do you spell road? R-O-A-D, R-O-D-E, R-O-W-E-D. There's all sorts of spoken. So this is just a, 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 another way that miscommunication can sometimes happen. Might seem unrealistic, but I have encountered real examples of this in my own life. And this leads to garden path sentences. Again, something that uh, is a, a very niche type of uh, miscommunication. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's very devious. Garden path sentences are sentences that you're reading and you're walking down the garden path. Imagine that you're walking down a garden path as you read the sentence, and all of a sudden it takes an unexpected turn. You say, oh, wait, I need to back up and, and see, I didn't expect that turn. I need to go down this garden path again and start over. This is a garden path sentence, such as the old man, the boat. You start to read this, the old man, the boat, all of a sudden makes you stop in your tracks and go, wait a second, I need to go back to the start of this sentence and reread it to try and understand what is this sentence trying to communicate. What is this sentence trying to say? There you go, yes. Here's another one. The complex, well, I'll just say your houses, married and single soldiers and their families. <laughs> That's a tricky one. There's a famous one. Time flies like an arrow. Flute, fruit flies like a banana. That's a very famous one. That's an example of a garden path sentence. I just see Joe Hours in the back there. Joe recently turned me on to a wonderful article just a few days hot off the presses. And the title of the article and the subtitle I recognize as garden path sentences. So you're saying, well, in my workplace, we don't talk about fruit flies and bananas. However, in a major publication, this was the title. Elon Musk funded XPRIZE expands education software testing. It made me stumble when I read that the first time, as did the subtitle. Uh, it has teamed up, Elon Musk has teamed up with various organizations to test software kids and use to teach themselves. I had to go back and read that several times. It was very difficult for me to parse and make sense of it. So it does happen in real life, and it could cause miscommunication. McGurk effect. I'm not going to click on this, but this is essentially a, a, a pop culture name for a, a bad lip reading. Again, if you choose an inappropriate medium and you're doing face-to-face -face communication, the most effective form that we have at our disposal, using words face-to-face -face so they can see you and hear you and watch your body, sometimes uh, if you don't hear the word, you might read their lips, and the McGurk effect can still cause miscommunication. It's when you misinterpret the movements of the mouth and, with the uh, words that you're hearing or not hearing. Uh, grammatical errors. There's Groucho with his famous quote, one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How I got in my pajamas? I don't know. How many people here have wonderful grammar, never make typos or mistakes? Yeah, I didn't raise my hand either. Email. Text messages, Slack, is now a very common form of communication. Now sometimes when you're speaking to somebody, it's not as important. Grammatical errors don't show up as obvious. But in email, especially formal email uh, communications, this can be very, very bad. It can lead to a lot of miscommunication. Shallow agreement. This is, sure. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen it as a brain game, something it's called? They had a session where they showed people saying something. Yes. But then the, the words that were actually heard were different. And it just played games with you back and forth on that. It was amazing. Those are two links. That first one goes to that video you're talking about. <laughs> yes. It's the brain games link of somebody saying ba, 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 ba. And then they show the exact same video, but this time the sound you hear is fa, 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 fa. And then the second link goes to Bad Lip Reading, which is a wonderful YouTube channel. <laughs> and it's just a very fun example where they take famous uh, people in very famous situations, like uh, um, uh, being sworn in as president, and they'll lip dub it so it says something funny. But anyway, that's all the McGurk effect, and it can lead to miscommunication. All right. Shallow agreement. Somebody mentioned this earlier when we were talking about recognizing miscommunication. Um, if you can recognize that it's happening, that's wonderful. However, my favorite quote about communication comes from George Bernard Shaw. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Love that quote. My favorite quote in communication. In other words, you're speaking with someone in a meeting or a face-to-face -face conversation, and 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes go by, and you walk out of that meeting or away from that conversation, you go, wow, 
excellent meeting, great communication. We really shared ideas. And you don't even realize that you didn't at all because shallow agreement um, was happening. You were using words and you had meaning attached to those words. That person heard the word, but they had different meaning attached to the words, but you never clarified that you had different meaning attached to the same word. That's shallow agreement. So sometimes you don't recognize that you miscommunicated until after the fact. You walk out of that meeting, that went great. And then two days later, they did something different. You go, why did you do that? Well, didn't you say this? I did say that. And I did that. <laughs> Wait a second. Maybe we had shallow agreement during the meeting. Maybe we actually didn't recognize that we were miscommunicating. OK, what are some effects of miscommunication? Uh, historic, mine and yours, I usually open it up for people to share theirs. I won't do that today. Historic, are you ready for a surprising effect of miscommunication? There you go. Hiroshima and Nagasaki is one of the most famous examples. Linguists know this. That happened, and you can trace it back, because of a miscommunication, a mistranslation. So basically, uh, the Allies kept asking Japan, surrender, surrender, surrender. Japan said, no, no, no. And then in the Potsdam Declaration of, uh, I forget the date, they sent over another uh, request for Japan, basically said, hey, give up. And Japan wrote a response, and the response included this word, mokusatsu, in it. Now, mokusatsu has four different meanings. Take no notice of, treat something with silent contempt, ignore it, or remain in wise and masterly inactivity. So basically, they kept saying over and over, we're not going to surrender, we're not going to surrender, we're not going to give up. And this time, they just said, blah, 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 mokusatsu, which meant we're just going to remain in a wise and masterly inactivity, kind of just like not even acknowledge the fact that you sent this over. However, when they sent this response back to the Allied forces, the translator read it as treat with uh, silent contempt. That's a very different meaning than just kind of silent masterly inactivity. The Allies got this and said, oh, contempt. That's what they said? Well, then. About a week later, the bomb was dropped. And they traced it back to that mistranslation, that miscommunication. Millions of lives lost because of a miscommunication. The epilogue to the story is once they figured out that that's the reason, Japan said, that's not what we meant. We didn't meant we con contempt. We didn't have no contempt for you. We're just saying, we're just going to stay silent on your latest request. Now, all sorts of linguists are hired by the government to have different perspectives and and very detailed comb through documents to make sure that what is being said and translated is, is actually what was intended. Um, mine, milk and avocados. This isn't a real one, this is a joke. My wife asked me to go to the store and pick up a gallon of milk. She said, if they have avocados, get six. And I came home with six gallons of milk. She said, why? I said, they, have they had avocados. <laughs> Silly. A real one. I've already talked about my divorce. This was a very real impact and effective miscommunication. I figured out that my marriage failed because we weren't communicating. We were having shallow agreement, not realizing that the things we were saying we attached different meaning and values to. Definition of done. Anybody have a struggle with this in your company? I've been all over the world with this talk, and everybody has a struggle with the definition of done at their particular company. I went to one company, and they had a glossary, and they had done, and this is what we mean when we say the word done in our company. And then they had another term that they called done done. And they had a different definition. They had another term called done done done. And a third definition. And I thought this is ludicrous. This is ridiculous. And then I thought about it and said this is brilliant. Because every time somebody in that context, that company says this is done done. The other person on that, in that company knows that they don't mean done 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 and they don't just mean done. They mean exactly done done. They've come up with a shared common language, and we'll talk about that in a moment, to be able to better and more effectively communicate with each other. They have created stipulated definitions for these terms. So it's brilliant. I was uh, helping review a document, a uh, multi-page document in a room, and we were all going through, and the author was reading it out loud on the overhead, and he came to this phrase, we need to culturally encourage HR to blah, blah, blah. And I said, hold on a second. What do you mean by culturally encourage? What does that mean? And he said, oh, well, culturally encourage, and he talked for 10 minutes explaining it. Oof. That 10 minutes that you just talked was all packed into those two little words. There's no chance that somebody reading this document is going to have 10 minutes of meaning packed into those two words. You need to expand that meaning in your document. If that's what you mean, nobody's going to understand all that meaning in just those two words. Um, finally, yours, I'll, I'll skip that part for today, but I'm sure that each of you has examples where you didn't recognize miscommunication was happening, you only recognized the effects of it afterwards. All right, when to reduce miscommunication. Uh, first, consider the audience, the environment, the risk. Is it always appropriate uh, to communicate? Is miscommunication OK sometimes? What might be an advantage of miscommunication? 
<laughs> Lying. <laughs> yeah, okay, I like that. What's another one? Why might, be it, why might it be advantageous to miscommunicate? Maybe purposefully or maybe accidentally. What could happen that's a benefit because you accidentally miscommunicated? What's that? Maybe time. Yeah. Oh, thank God. I didn't understand you the first time. If I had done it immediately, something bad would have happened. Yeah? That creativity of somebody by misinterpreting what you're saying like, leads it up to them to interpret. Absolutely. Sure. Creativity and learning can come from that. Yeah, that's a great reason. Sometimes, purposely or even accidental miscommunication can lead to great things. It can buy you some time. It can lead to creativity, learning, saying, boy, I did it wrong the first time because I didn't understand you. Now that I better understand you, I'll do it right. But gee whiz, I learned so much from doing it wrong that way the first time. So sometimes you also need to consider the audience. Who are you speaking to? Is it really imperative that they get the message completely, fully, totally? Or am I speaking to somebody where it's okay if, if they get the general gist? What's the environment? Where are you? Where are you talking? What's the risk if, they, if, they, if miscommunication happens? What if they don't understand? Are millions of lives going to be lost or are they going to get me the wrong beer? What's the risk if miscommunication happens? All right, finally, how to reduce miscommunication. Here's a whole bunch of quick ways on how to reduce miscommunication. Definition dissection. That's that big process I did at the beginning with the word definition. Now, I'm not suggesting that you stop and do this every time you're trying to communicate with somebody. They say, hello. You say, hold on. What do you mean by hello? I mean, it's a greeting. What does greeting mean? What is... That's ridiculous. However, sometimes a definition of a term and the meaning attached to that word is very, very, very important. If it's very important, then going through this process might make sense. Taking the time to get deep, deep understanding by doing this recursive type of thing, maybe in a group setting, can give you much deeper understanding and better, be better understood and better understand others. So definition dissection is one way to get deep understanding and reduce miscommunication. Etymology, history or roots, I found it very helpful to look up sometimes the origin of a word to better understand, ah, this is where it came from, this is how it's evolved. OED, not Oxford English Dictionaries, but OED, which is also available online for a subscription or a library card, is very good at this. They trace the history of, of words and they show obsolete words, words that have rare definitions and the more common definitions, they have a little rating system. Sometimes that will give me deeper understanding of the meaning behind a word or why someone might say that this word means this to them. I look up the history and I say, oh, I can see why you might attach that meaning to this word. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I end the presentation with that same game at the very top, the idiom game again. Now you have a, a richer tool belt, maybe some new tools or tools you already had are richer, and you're able to use those tools to play the idiom game again. Exactly that. Um, synonyms. Sometimes if you're struggling to communicate with someone and you feel like you might be miscommunicating, use synonyms. I don't understand that word. Well, here are three or four words that are basically the same as that. Uh, that uh, game, Say It With Feeling, where I hand out cards that have emotions on them, they have a couple different things. One might say angry, but it doesn't just say angry because there might be someone in the crowd that doesn't know the word angry. So it also says frustrated or upset. So three kind of words that all mean roughly the same thing. Each card also has three images of someone that looks angry. So even if they can't read the words, I have extensional definitions where I can, they can look at an image and say, ah, this is an example of someone that's angry. So they can get up and read, we have enough food to last for a week. Even if they don't know the words, they have images or they have synonyms. Sometimes antonyms are a good way. If someone doesn't understand what you're trying to get across, what a word means or an idea, give them the exact opposite if such a thing exists. That might help them. Okay, you're really struggling with this idea. It's not this idea. And you explain that and they say, oh, that helps me better understand the idea that you are trying to communicate. Asking, my number one go-to tip, ask. But again, social norms make that difficult. Sometimes asking someone can be very difficult, especially in a group setting. Raising your hand in a meeting where you feel like you might be the only one can be very tough. However, it's also the most effective. Just ask. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you please explain it? Or if you are the sender and you see someone's face twisting up or you sense that they might not be mis or might, that miscommunication might be happening, ask them, do you understand what I'm saying? I don't mean to insult you. I don't mean to talk down. I'm just asking so that we don't have shallow agreement, so that we can avoid miscommunication. Ask. Examples, extensional, uh, ostensive. These are, again, two different categories of definitions. If someone's struggling to understand an idea, give them examples of the idea. This is kind of um, 
uh, specifications and requirements documents. These are, in essence, intentional definitions. You're defining some product with a bunch of definitions in the form of requirements and specifications. You know what a mock-up is or a prototype? Those are extensional, ostensive defin definitions. Now, I read through the specifications and I read through the requirements. You have this idea in your head for a product. You've written some of these ideas down explicitly on a piece of paper and called it the requirements or specifications document. I'm still not getting it. Well, let me make you a mock-up so you can see what I'm talking about. An example, those are another way of expressing ideas. Um, explain, describe, use precise definitions. Someone's struggling with a definition, explain it to them. Explanations is different than a definition. And be more precise. I don't know what a ghost is. Though it's dead and appears to the living, it's translucent. Say, it also could be uh, unholy. It also could be give more information. That could help them. Be careful not to, you can stipulate, but be careful not to use persuasive, emotive language. But help them by describing something, by using precise definitions. Paraphrasing. Sometimes if someone's struggling with an idea, uh, or, or if someone's talking to me, I've done this several times at the conference already, someone's asked me a question, or someone's made a statement, and I say, can you say that again using different words? They, oh, sure. And they say the exact same idea, but using different words. And maybe that helps me better understand their question and better able to respond and communicate with them. Maybe it helps me better understand the statement that they've just said because they've said the same thing in two different ways. Sometimes I'll ask others if I see their face twisting up or I sense miscommunication might be happening, I'll say, let me try and state it a different way and I'll paraphrase. Similar to that is metaphors and analogies. Someone's struggling to understand an idea in one context, switch the context to something that they might be more familiar with using a metaphor or analogy. So you're struggling to understand testing and test scripts, and it's a series of, it's a, it's a series of steps with expected results, perhaps. And OK, are you, you cook, right? OK, so you have recipes. And recipes have do this first, do that second, do that. A test, is, a test script, a formalized test script, is kind of like a, uh, a recipe. Using a metaphor or analogy might help better under, them better understand you and get your idea into their head. Drawing. I, uh, as an artist, I often lean on this, but many of us have whiteboards in our office. And sometimes explaining a database connects to these different servers and this happens. Abstract concepts can be very difficult to define or write down in words, but by using non-words, using drawings and images might be another way to help get your idea into their head or vice versa. Reverse dictionary. These exist online and these are a lot of fun. Um, you can type in an idea, a yellow fruit with a peel, and it'll say, we think you're thinking of the word banana. It's a, these are online. But it's also useful if you're talking to somebody. This happens to me sometimes. Is, um, I'll be at a new company and I'll say, okay, uh, I'd like to do this uh, testing in this next phase. And they say, what kind of testing do you want? I say, well, I'm not gonna use a word because there might be assumptions and baggage. You might already have a meaning. This is the type of testing I want you to do. I want you to take all of the tests that you currently have, pick out just a handful of those tests, the ones that are very important that just test the base functionality that you can run through very quickly, and just run those, and the, based on the results of those handful of tests, we'll know if further testing uh, should, should continue. And they go, oh, smoke testing? I go, oh, cool, that's what you call it? Then yes, I've just used a reverse dictionary. Uh, now I can just say smoke testing every time because we share the meaning. I can use this short term that means this big thing, rather than saying smoke testing and hope that they have the same meaning. Five W's. This is used by reporters and investigative journalists. Who, what, when, why, where, and sometimes how. If you're struggling to understand what someone's saying or you're trying to express an idea to someone else, you might tell them who and the what and the why and the where. If you can identify all these different things about your idea, if it, if it makes sense for that particular idea, it might uh, help them better understand the idea. Change perspective, back to the idea of relativism and the relative rule. I'm trying to explain something to Dave over there, and I'm really struggling, he's not getting me. If I know something about Dave, I might be able to better step into his shoes, see through his eyes, think through his head, and feel through his heart, and maybe that will help me better communicate with Dave. Change perspective, empathy, this type of thing will help me better communicate with him. Safety language. Uh, this is the, the fun term for it. This is the technical term for it. Epistemic modality. Modalities are ways of speaking. Epistemic modality is all about truth and confidence in truth. Safety language is about uh, speaking in a way that you build in um, how much you believe in the thing that you're saying. For instance, if I was to say, somebody said, hey, what's the weather outside? And I say, it is raining. It's very definitive. I know that it is raining. Remember Anton Wilson's quote, is, 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 it is raining. 
Instead, speaking with safety language or epistemic modality might be, from where I'm standing, from the view that I have, it appears to me, using my senses, that it appears to be raining. Ridiculous. Who's going to speak like that? However, what if someone said, hey, is that bug fixed? Yes, it is fixed. Very definitive. Might it be better to say, I have tested the bug on my machine and Bill's machine, and on this particular build, at this particular time, on these particular machines, it appears to be fixed. We we'll say, okay, that's enough evidence for us, we'll ship it, or why don't we test it on a few more machines rather than it is fixed. So sometimes safety language, or speaking with epistemic modality, it builds in a sense of confidence, saying that this is how confident I am in the thing that I'm saying by using extra words. Some people use this for bad, just like a hammer can be used for good or bad, epistemic modality some people use for CYA to get themselves out. Well, I didn't say that. What I said was, so you can use these kind of helpful tools in your belt for good or for evil. I suggest using this particular tool to help others better understand you. Finally, again, we end with the, uh, the idioms again. I have people read through these, and now that they have a richer tool belt, they try and use some of these tools to see if they can deduce the meanings of these different idioms. Um, the last section, and we're coming up 10 minutes left, so I don't get into it very deeply, and the rest of the time in the workshop is really just a long exercise. Common languages, I talk about the definition in history and the benefits and limitations. Common languages, also called lingua franca or trade languages, started uh, from, from traders in the Mediterranean. You'd have uh, Spaniards and Greeks and Turks, and they were all trading goods and services with one another, but the Spaniard didn't speak Greek and the Greek didn't speak Turkish, so they really had a difficulty trading, and that was their, their occupation. So they came up with a lingua franca, language of the Franks, a combination of a bunch of different languages that they could use to communicate with people, other traders of different nationalities and different languages. And it enabled them to do their profession, to trade goods and services. However, when the Greek got back home to Athens and he went to his wife, he could not speak that common language that he used on the boat with the traders from Italy because his wife didn't share this common language, this shared language. So it had a benefit in that it allowed him to do something, but it had a limitation that it was only in some particular context. Outside of that context, the language was no good. Think about how this applies to you at your company. Every company is a bubble. It's a context. So you come up with some type of shared language, and you have an onboarder or somebody that's onboarded, and you say, well, here's the language that we use at this company. Here's our abbreviations, our acronyms, our jargon. Here's our definition of done-done versus done-done-done. And now you can speak to us, and we'll understand you, and you'll understand us. But understand, when you pick up the phone and talk to a client, they might not understand you. So if you say something's done done to a client, you might have to explain to them what that means. I'm working on, uh, with a company right now where they have some terms, break, fix, defect, enhancement, and bug. And they have some language, and they'd like me to come in and help facilitate a discussion to create a glossary specifically around those four terms. Why those four terms? Because those are written in the contracts that they have with clients. Say only a certain number of bugs can be uh, in, in a particular build. What if they say, well, we, we had this many bugs, the other two were glitches, so we're still contractually okay. So language is very important. So this is why they're having me come in to help them define something that they can have a common language, a lingua franca inside the company. They can use that language in contracts and explain that language in the words and terms that they mean clearly with all the essential characteristics of a bug versus the essential characteristics and properties of a defect to their clients and make stronger contracts. Um, the rest of the exercise is basically I use the rest of the time and I release the class to get into groups and we try and come up with a common shared language. So this last time I gave it was at a testing conference, so they pick a word off of here, like what does assurance or staging mean? What does the word staging mean? And what we try and do is come to a common shared understanding of the definition, a lexical definition, an intentional definition of the word staging. And here's what happens. It usually fails. We have 30, 40, 50 people in a room, and they struggle. Here's what I think staging is. And somebody else will say, well, at our company, it means this. OK, but in this room, we think it means this with somebody else. But doesn't it also mean that? And you have to consider this and that. And the conversation goes on and on and on. And after 15 minutes, you haven't come to a definition of staging. And the point is, it's very difficult to come to an agreement of terms. But that shouldn't be a reason to give up. I believe having a common language in your context, your team, your department, your company is very important to help others better understand you and you understand others. So keep at it, because I think it's very important. So we're at our destination. Hopefully, you've gotten a deeper understanding of communication. It's shared with all the other people in this room. As soon as you walk out of this context in this bubble, no one's going to understand 
uh, anything that we talked about. Uh, hopefully you are able to better understand others and be better understood. And hopefully a lot of you have shared your expectations why you came today. I hope that those have been fulfilled as well. Thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, please come see me if you're interested in a longer version and Q&A for the last 10 minutes or so. None. I've communicated that well. Yes. Um, what would you recommend for a good strategy when you're in an organization where you have people who have been there for varying lengths of time and they're over time names of things have changed to come up with a common I guess I'm looking to maybe create a common dictionary or glossary of terms. So mm -hmm. we'll say when they say this for you it also means this or this or this. All these mean the same thing. Uh, say that in a different way, please. Sure. Um, so, for example, some people, I work at Ohio State University, so some of our coordinators, when they're talking about sending our students to a different institution for learning, some will say institution, some will say site, mm. some will say they have different words based on when they've been at the university because the curriculum has changed and how gotcha. much things. Even with courses themselves, they're, Courses, uh, methods, yeah. the day, it's all so some, I think internally you might have some control or ability to influence the words and language and meaning that's attached to those words, but externally you can't control what other people call them. So uh, one suggestion might be when they use a word, say, how do you define that? What do you mean by this word? Now, there's an interesting thing when you're defining terms is the difference between understanding and agreeing. They may say a class is, this is what we mean by a, a class or a course. You say, well, that's not what it means. But as long as you understand, you might disagree with their meaning attached to that word. But if you understand the meaning attached to that word, you can communicate with them. So I would ask them to define terms. And you might offer the same to them. Say, here's the, the glossary or definitions and terms that we've come up with. So when we say course, this is what we mean. Is that helpful? Yes. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend for like better written communication? Because it's happened saying in the IT world that everybody relies on user story yeah. to understand what they're developing. Mm. When you're in a room, they seem to understand it, but then when they go back, it's like, oh, I didn't talk that because it was a plain, simple English. I don't know what that means. Okay. So there's agreement in the room, seeming uh, uh, ostensible agreement in the room where people say, we all agree on this, and then they go off separately. How has that agreement come to in the room where people say, we all agree on this? Is it vocalized? It, it's just like, this is like, okay, we have a short time. We look at the user story. Yeah, it makes sense what we're trying to do. But when we start coding, it means completely different or that's not how it works. There's, there's an idea about different types of knowledge, which is, Poliani did a lot of work. There's explicit knowledge, implicit knowledge, and tacit knowledge. Explicit is things that are easy to encode and write down using various forms and symbols, letters that make up words. And you can, I have an idea in my head and I'm able to write these things down. Implicit knowledge are the things that are not explicitly write, written down, but you could write them down if you needed to. But tacit knowledge are things kind of like the ineffable and ineffable solutions, things that are very difficult to express in words, like kneading bread dough or how to ride a bike or tie a knot. These are things that would be very difficult to encode through, through drawing or, or words. So when you're trying to, somebody has, I have an idea for a feature or a function or an application, and we're going to explicitly write down on a card, there's also tons of implicit things that aren't written down, and there's probably a lot of tacit things that are associated with this idea that can't be written down. So talk about those things, at least to expose the impl implications and assumptions that are built in, because the requirements, people sometimes talk about a complete requirement stock. Ha! Huh. It's impossible. You can't write down all of the things that are required because there's a zillion things that are implied by that. Um, similarly for tacit, that's where you, the developer or someone gets back to their desk and they are now using their, uh, by Satir's interaction model, their past experience, their context to interpret things and fill in the blanks for this tacit knowledge. Well, this is how I think it should be. So maybe if they're able to express that uh, in a group setting, people could say, whew, I'm glad we talked about this um, and came to an uh, understanding. It might be some disagreement that you have to get over, but at least you understand. Is that helpful? Yeah, but more but. confusing, but yes. Oh, more confusing. Oh, no. Would you like to talk afterwards? I can. Uh...
Okay, I'll see if I can help more. Sure. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes. If you're writing your, your longer presentation, mm -hmm. is there information at your website about your program and how long it is and how it's priced and all that kind of stuff? All of those things except for price. Ineffable-solutions.com is my website. And this and all the other talks and workshops are on there. And uh, besides the exercises, which are fun and, and snipped out, the real thing that was missing today was the back and forth, the discussion, the exploration. That's the part that I love, and that's the part where I think the learning really happens. And, um, typical uh, one day workshop, would you say, or half day? Uh, half, half is tight, full day is, is about right. Yeah. I just gave it about a month ago uh, for a corporation, and it did it in about six hours. Yes? If there's a lot of emotion getting in the way of mm -hmm. communication, would you recommend, like, within a team, would you recommend a non-biased individual coming in? That can help. Uh, I think emotions are necessary. In fact, they're impossible to eliminate. There's a whole other talk I have, uh, The Hidden Requirements, Exploring Emotions with Placebos, where I uh, dig into emotional considerations when building software, building, designing, testing software. And in fact, none of us are completely logical. No one's Spock, no one's data. Everyone, you can't even function without emotions. They help you decide and, and live your life and think what you think and say what you say. So I think emotions are important, but they can also get out of control, which can cause problems. So sometimes an unbiased observer, unbiased observer uh, is helpful in the room to help um, kind of facilitate that conversation. And also understand, if there's emotions, what's the reason for those emotions? That might be very, very important. If someone is being very emotional about, I totally disagree with this definition or this meaning, I don't, well, what is causing that anger? They must feel very passionately about that for some reason. Try and get to the root of that, because it's not coming from nowhere. Okay. 2.30. We got a, a break and a keynote and, and then drink time. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks.